my uh, pleasure here is to introduce a, a speaker to you, and, uh, and after I've now welcomed you very uh, warmly to this national meeting, this, is, this meeting is actually for you, as a matter of fact. Uh, we created this for you, and I'm really happy you enjoy it, but uh, this speaker is a really prominent person and someone who actually worked very closely with, with uh, Professor Narayana Murthy as well. So, so it's all kind of, uh, you know, all connected together. Um, Robert C. Dines, he's a keynote speaker. He worked at Bell Laboratories also with Vanke for 22 years, as a matter of fact. Uh, he's a professor of physics at UC uh, San Diego, uh, where he directs a laboratory that focuses on superconductivity. He served as a chancellor of UC San Diego. If you're looking to get in there, by the way, you might talk to him about that. He can probably work it out for you. Uh, from 1996 to 2003, uh, after uh, six years in the physics department there, and then he, where he founded an interdisciplinary laboratory in which uh, chemists, electrical engineers, and private industry researchers investigated the properties of metals and semiconductors and superconductors. And then he served as the on to be the president of the University of California system, that is the system over the entire 10 campuses of the UC operation, of which I'm sure you're all applying to in one way or another, from 2003 to 2008, before returning back to the faculty at UCSD. Uh, he re received the 1990 Fritz London Memorial Prize in low temperature physics from the American Physical Society, and he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in, in 1989. And he's a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and all kinds of fancy, important organizations. He, he serves on the uh, Executive Committee of the Council on Competitiveness. He's actually a native of uh, London, Ontario, and, and is a naturalized U.S. citizen. And he holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics and physics and an honorary degree of laws degree from the University of Western Ontario. Master and doctoral degrees in physics and an honorary doctoral degree also from McMaster University in Canada. And he's an honorary doctorate also from the, the University of Montreal. I'd like to uh, have you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Dines to the podium to speak for you today for a few minutes. Bob? Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to stand up here, and I'm going to pretty much reminisce about 50 years of friendship with Vanke and, and intertwine his career, science and engineering. Uh, and I hope when you walk out of here, or I hope to inspire you to believe that you can actually do whatever you want. And, um, and, and I hope that you'll walk out of here believing that. Uh, the problem is I, I can't do anything I want because I don't know how to turn on my slides. <laughs> how do I turn on my slides? Is there a button here? Ha! Okay. I can do anything I want. I just need help. Um, this, okay, so this is the, very, this is the cold, um, un, un, impersonal, boring resume uh, just hitting the highlights of, of, of Venke's scientific career. Uh, Bell Laboratories, got this. It's this one. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> the old switcheroo. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, um, Bell Laboratories, um, uh, from 68 to 87. Sandia, for five years. Sandia Labs, vice president for research at Sandia. You've heard all this. And, and then, uh, and then he moved to academia from Sandia to uh, UC Santa Barbara. And then he took on um, what turned out to be an enormous task, which was um, to build a school of engineering and applied sciences at Harvard uh, and, um, until 2008. And then he has moved his interests and passion uh, he hasn't given up his passion to the others. He's moved his interest and passion to the Center for Science and International Affairs, basically science and policy. And, um, and I'm going to make a comment about that at the end. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, yes. In September the, on September the 3rd, 1968, long before any of you were ever thought of, <laughs> two skinny kids, this was the day after Labor Day, Two skinny young kids showed up 
at Bell Laboratories. These are lousy photographs, but that's the technology we had in those days. Um, one uh, f from India through Cornell, and one from Canada. We both showed up the same day. It was our first day of work at Bell Laboratories. And, uh, and we were both in personnel, and that's where we met. We met sitting at a, at, in a room in personnel. There were several other people there too, but, but I met Venki there. And uh, we wore jackets and ties, so we've come full circle. We wore jackets and ties again. We wore jackets and ties. I look like a hood. That, that's me on the right, in case you hadn't figured it out. <laughs> and that's Venki on the left. Um, but, but there are a couple of things of interest. Firstly, we, we wore jackets and ties. And the second thing of interest is um, there's a number there, 1116 and 1151. We were in different departments. We had been hired to different departments. Uh, very different, actually different organizations at Bell Labs. But um, within weeks and months, we were starting to talk about science together and doing science and collaborating and interacting. And, and within a year or so, we started to do experiments together and we started interacting. That was the beginning of, an, of, a, of, a, of a tremendous ride for me with Venki. And uh, Bell Labs wasn't above having publicity pictures taken. And there we are. That's us. This guy here, in case you haven't figured it out, is Venki. And that's me. Um, and we were, we were the, the, the picture was staged, but we were putting a sample uh, we were studying actually phonon propagation in germanium. And we were putting this sample into a cryostat. The date, 1971. And uh, it, was, it was the first set of experiments that we did, which um, resulted in close to 15 years of a collabor scientific collaboration together. I mean, the collaboration has been going on, but not the scientific collaboration. And it was, it was wonderful. It was a, these were funny times. They were fun times. They were scientifically frustrating times. They were scientifically rewarding times. Things worked. Things didn't work. We were under two different organizations that had different, actually, missions. But we were, but we were so encouraged to work together. And, and as Venki said already, it didn't matter. Nobody actually knew whether you were an engineer, a mathematician, a theoretical physicist, a material scientist. Nobody knew. It didn't matter. The currency of the realm was good ideas and whether you could actually accomplish those. So there we are. Um, we, 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 got in, we, we got into funny habits. The friendship grew. The friendship with Venki, the friendship with Jaya, his wife. And my family and his family, our families grew up together. We, 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 we went out to Cape Cod together. We vacationed together. Um, I am still, I've learned, Uncle Bob to Venki's daughter. And so that, that relationship, the science and the personal relationships just grew and grew. But we were doing science all the time, and we did a hell of a lot of science. Um, we wrote 47 papers together. Uh, and you can get that by just going to the, to the web now. I, never, I didn't know that number until I went and looked at it. There are 47 papers we wrote together. Um, and, and this is a plot of the number of citations of our papers. We wrote papers from 1971 until about 1982 or so, somewhere in here. And the nifty thing about that is that those papers are still cited today, still referenced. It was good science, and good science prevails. And as of 2004, people are still reading those papers and citing them and, 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 and working off the science that we learned 
in that period. And, and it's pretty steady. So, so this, was, this was a product of Bell Laboratories that was just a joy. And we just kept doing things. There were other, other personal things that, that we did. We played tennis together. I didn't belong on the same court with him. But he was kind enough to play with me, and we played squash together. I only did that a few times because I got these welts in the back. In, in the, you know, when the guy hits you with a squash ball because you're in his way. And, um, but anyway, we, we would go out, and after, after, after lunch, we'd go out and walk around the building in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And Vanky would always pull this little plastic bag out, and he'd say, there was betel nut in this bag. I said, what the hell is betel nut? And so I looked it up. And so he gave me some betel nut. So I was chewing betel nut. I suspected I was eating a controlled substance. <laughs> and I think if you read that description of it, it probably was a controlled substance. But, but that was the kind of relationship where we'd talk about science. We'd talk about applications. We'd talk about where the science is going. And, and who... Who, who are collaborators and where that's, where that's going. And, and, and so that evolved. So the relationship evolved over those years. But we also had another strange habit. Um, to Vanky, Friday was a lucky day. This is, this, is a science, this is a scientist and engineer I'm telling you about now. Friday was a lucky day. And so every paper we ever mailed off was mailed on Friday. In those days, you had to mail papers. You couldn't just click return. You had to mail them. You had to put them in the mail. And before we did that, I had, a, I had an electromagnetic screen room because we were, we were looking at, at low noise signals. And inside that screen room was a little shrine to uh, Ganeshaya, who's an Indian god. And we would go in there, in that screen room, to that shrine. This is the same one. I managed to steal it when I left Bell Labs. <laughs> and we'd put a, an offering. This, this is, I think, an old thermos bottle cup or something. We'd put an offering in that cup. And uh, there are still coin, oh, coins, you know, a quarter, a dime, a nickel, something. And, and it just accumulated over the years. But this was a scientist and engineer who had these kinds of superstitions. So if you have superstitions, it's okay. It's okay. Just don't let them dominate your creativity. So anyway, we, we, we had these strange habits. And, uh, and people around us used to refer to us because we, had, we were so close, we had collaborations, we were doing science, we were working all the time. We would work from the crack of dawn till well after, well after everybody went home. And, and people referred to us as the Bobsy Twins. Now, none of you know who the Bobsy Twins are. I understand that, except for some of the gray-haired eminences in the front and back row. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a set of books uh, that, that were in the 40s and 50s, I think, and described these two... These, these twins that looked alike, and they were, they were inseparable. And, and we were referred to as the Bobsy Twins. Now, I, if you look at the pictures of Venki and me, I don't think you could possibly be persuaded that we were the Bobsy Twins. <laughs> but that's what happened. Anyway, it was, a, it was a glorious time. But Venki also had a social, um, a social conscience as well. And early in that period, Venki, Lou Lanzarotti, and I formed, with some AT&T Foundation money, a couple of programs called the uh, Cooperative Research Fellows Program and the Graduate Women's Research Fellowship Program. We started off at, with just a Cooperative Research Fellow Program, and within days, we both had women in our offices beating us up, saying, this is not fair, this is only for what we then called minorities, uh, there has to be a program for women as well. So we made the case and won, and so we created two programs. And since that time, uh, that program at Bell Laboratories has, has produced over 300, I think it's about 400, 
PhDs in engineering, physics, chemistry, mathematics that are everywhere in the world now. They're on faculty, they're in industrial laboratories, and, and if you look at the, um, if you look at the, the, the population of women and what were then what we call minorities um, underserved, and where they are now, this program that Venki, Lou Lenzer, and I, Adi and I created had a huge impact. Now here are the numbers as of 2002. It's harder to get after 2002 because something bad happened to Bell Labs. And so it's hard to get data after that. But if you look at it, the number of war, awards where, where, where we would not only award graduate fellowships for students, but we would mentor them as well. So, so I had a student at Cornell, for example, and when things went awry, as they often do for graduate students, when they went awry, I'd pick up the phone to someone who will remain unnamed and said, what the hell's going on up there? And it just took that kind of an interception to make sure things were okay. And it's something that I think Venki should feel very proud of is the creation of this program. I know I feel very proud of the creation of this program because it's made in America a substantial difference in the faculty uh, and, 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 and the staff in, in, in industrial uh, laboratories and, and industrial productivity throughout the, throughout the country. Um, it was hard to get these numbers because of the bad things that happened to Bell Labs, but, but you know, over time, we had to grow up. And this, this, is, this is the bad news for you kids. At some point, you're going to have to grow up. But we didn't grow up until the 80s. <laughs> and here's a picture of us, uh, the Bobsy twins. That's Venky on the right. And that's me on the left. Uh, my hair was not gray then. Um, and, and we're meeting, this was a meeting in Bell Labs uh, with a, a joint meeting with NTT, Nippon Telephone and Telegraph. And we were both running organizations at Bell Labs. Um, and we, we started put wearing ties again. So we had gone from ties to no ties, and now we had ties again. But we unfortunately had to grow up and, and pay back for all the fun we had for the previous 15 to 20 years. And so at that point, I left and came to the University of California, San Diego at the end of that decade. Venki left and went to Sandia Labs. And so, so it was just one of those, the evolution of life that you don't know about yet, but you will. And, 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 and we, we left, and it's interesting, if you now Google Bell Laboratories, on my Google search engine, the first thing that comes up is this. Welcome to Bell Laboratories, an exclusive manufacturer of rodent control products. Bell Laboratories produces the highest quality. I didn't make this up. I just couldn't believe it. So this is what happens after we left. <laughs> now, if you go to the second on the list, it describes Bell Laboratories and what Bell Laboratories does. But this was the first on the list. And, uh, and they, th this company has existed for a long time. They call themselves Bell Labs. Kind of neat, huh? Anyway, um, back to Venki. He went off to Sandia. And uh, there he is at Sandia. I picked this out of, a, out of a publication of Sandia, and I rooted around trying to figure out what he did at Sandia. He was vice president of research. Venki was Venki, which means that he was incredibly energetic, enthusiastic, prodded, probed, created new ideas. Um, but, but this is the only picture I could find of him. Look at this. He's on a phone a real phone with a cord. Um, that's a pencil sharpener. 
Do any of you know what pencil sharpeners are? Do you have pencil sharpeners? <laughs> That's a pencil sharpener. This is, this is an archive. Um, there's his computer. That's a cathode ray tube. Do any of you remember CRTs? <laughs> no, you don't know. Anyway, um, so that's, that's the best I could find out what he did at Sandia, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in a few minutes uh, to, to, to question what he did at Sandia. Uh, but time kept marching on, and then he went to Santa Barbara as the dean of engineering at Santa Barbara. And every time I ask about Venke's accomplishments at Santa Barbara, the one is always, he was so energetic, he created an environment of innovation, of creativity, of collaboration across, not only across engineering, but across the sciences as well at Santa Barbara. And in, and in recognition of what he accomplished, there's something now called the, uh, the, the, the Venke Award, um, Venkatesh Nanamuti Award, and it was, um, it, uh, it, was, it, was, it was bestowed, uh, uh, named after Veiki as Dean of College of Engineering at, for, for his leadership and support of the development of a thriving local entrepreneurial economy. And I would have expected nothing less. It was, it, Santa Barbara just kind of lit up. And I assumed that Venke was going to stay there and reap the rewards of all his energies and, and enterprise, but no. There's a message I'm giving. I'm, this is, I'm not just relating history. There's a message here about change, shifting sands, changing careers, and how you can keep moving all the while. But no. In 1998, he went to Harvard. Not to the Harvard School of Engineering. There was not one. He went to build the Harvard School of Engineering. And most of you, most of you that are under 30 won't understand what a difficult task that must have been. Because Harvard is Harvard. And, um, and it has old traditions. And this energetic, enthusiastic young man went to Harvard to build a school of engineering, which was not in the tradition of Harvard. And I rooted around to find one, at least one quote that probably best described the, um, how creative Venke must have been and in, in innovative in, in convincing the faculty of Harvard, that it was in their best interests, in the best interests of the nation, and the Harvard best interests, to build this school. There he is now. Well, that, there he was then. He's much better looking there than he was in that picture with me um, in 1968, I think. But there he is, looking like a dean now, not looking like a scientist. And the quote, which I'll read to you because it's sort of, I think it describes what I thought of the circumstances. Harvard would finally have the beginnings of what it had notably lacked for its entire 372-year history, a world-class engineering school on a par with the university's other famed dominions, such as business, law, and medicine. And he's done that. He's done that. Harvard went from not having an engineering school, applied sciences, but not an engineering school, to an engineering school that everyone is in awe of. It's a distinguished engineering school. Again, I thought Venky would just, eh, just, okay, now I've done that, let me relax. No. He kept doing science. All the while, he kept doing science. This is his publication list as a function of time from 1964 to 2014. This is the number of papers per year that he published. So i have come back to the one question that I asked I didn't know the answer to, and that is, what did he do at Sandia?
If anyone can answer that question, send me a note. <laughs> It'd be fun to know what he did at Sandia. He's, he's sitting down here smiling. He's just a Cheshire grid look at it. He, he just ran people's lives. Okay. Anyway, it's, it's pretty interesting. This is, a, this, this is the number of publications as a function of time. So all the way through this distinguished career, he kept doing science. And, and let me suggest that whether you're doing engineering or science, all the way through your distinguished career, you should continue to keep in touch with the bench because that's where the new ideas are going to happen. And the sooner you learn about them, the sooner you are in touch with them, the better you can do your job, whatever it will be in engineering. So here, here he is, 1968, and close to now. Um, he's a much better looking guy now than he was then. Um, but look at what he accomplished in between. This is the boring resume. It has nothing of his personality in there. It's really just where he was and what he did. So let me leave you with a thought. Way back when, when we were both at Bell Labs, our boss, who was a guy by the name of Arno Penzias, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, observing black body radiation and, uh, and the first real evidence for the, uh, the Big Bang and an exploding universe, he, um, he gave us all a book one year called Tolstoy's Bicycle. And, and the title came from, from the description of, and, and it described what people accomplished through their, through their lives at, at a different point in their lives. And the title came from the fact that Tolstoy learned to ride a bicycle at age 75. Not before. And, and the thesis is that you can do whatever you want when you want to do it. You just have to push hard. And sometimes the structure is designed to not let you, to get in your way. And, and I'll, read, um, I'll read a paragraph from, from this, this book, uh, this, this chapter called Scientific Creativity and Age. Because when you reach my age, you like to believe that you still have a few creative bones in your body. And this book makes the case with evidence that you do. But he said there's, there's society and structure is in the way to you, for you throughout your entire life. And I'll read this very short paragraph and listen to it. It is easy to show that our efficient career channeling, that is determining who goes where through career channeling, with its careful documentation of past performance, would have excluded some distinguished researchers in the past from pursuing their careers. Charles Darwin, for example, would not have done well if had he applied to UCCA London, the university clearinghouse on admissions, for his third attempt at training for a career. Even the switch to his second career training would be difficult. Today, it is depressing to realize that our efficient style career procedures are one based on a model of career development that may simply be wrong, and two, would have had the effect of excluding some of the greatest talents of the past. So don't give up. Take this guy's example. He's now at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. He's now a scientist thinking about social science. And I, I am excited about what he's going to accomplish next. Thank you. Sure. We have yeah, question two. I'm told I have time for questions. Um, so if you take my advice and not let the old farts get in your way, you'll ask me a question that you think um, you might want to ask. Come on. This, th th you're the brightest. <laughs> Okay. That's okay. Oh, there's a ah, okay. Who do you think would be an interesting guest of our source? 
the future best power source, power, energy, uh, everything. Everything. I think it'll be everything. Um, and and Venky will probably has a, a view of this because he's thought about this as well. My view is that it will be anything and everything. It'll be, it'll, it'll be more local. It'll be driven by what's, what, what, the, what the local resources are in some place. I, I was in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, a year ago, and they've built an entire city uh, that is driven by solar. It, um, the energy... The, 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 pop, the, the electric power, the desalination, and the agriculture is all driven by solar cells. Uh, at, about five years ago, I was there, and they, they said, ah, we want to build a new technology. I said, you've got to look at what your advantages are. What, what locally do you have that other people don't have? You've got sun. You've got steady, reliable sun. And solar cells are going to make it. So, so it'll, it'll, it'll be where... It'll, it'll be uh, it'll be water, it'll be wind, it'll be, it'll be everything depending upon what your competitive advantage is. It might even be nuclear. I think it will too. <laughs> yes? What book would you recommend for us to read if we want to be engineers? Like, was there a book that you really think anyone that wants to be an engineer should read? I'd say talk to engineers. Uh, I, I really would. I'd say, I'd say go find some engineers and ask them what their pathway was. Because, uh, because what you'll find, I think, is that, um, and, and, and people who, who, like me, who are actually not card-carrying engineers, but I'm an engineer, um, and, and, fi- and just, just look, at the, look at the wide variety of pathways to get there. There's just a huge number of pathways, and I don't think any one person can, can, can lay it down for you. If you're, you're bright, you just listen to other people and other pathways, and then build your own pathway. If you read a book, somebody wrote it, and you're going to get that prejudice. But in fact, Everyone should build their own pathway, and you should learn from other people's experience how to do it. So Bob, have them look at the NAE website. <laughs> look at the NAE website. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thanks, thanks very much. Oh, hold on, there's one more. You gave me an audience now. You can't t- pull me I off, Dan. Okay. How do you recommend we get involved with engineering at our age? How do I recommend you get involved with engineering where? At our age. At your age? Mm-hmm. Um, find, uh, um, how old are you? Uh, You're 14. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, you young thing. <laughs> um, I have in my laboratory on the San Diego campus, I have graduate students, I have undergraduates, and I have high school students. So, so wherever you're from, where are you from? San Diego. San Diego. So come up to UCSD or San Diego State and find, find someone who will take you into their research pr- program, whatever it is. And, 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 and listen carefully and learn. You'll, you'll learn more from graduate students than you will from professors. <laughs> and, and, and just find out what's turning them on. Um, because they'll, they'll relate to you. The professor, you won't even... <laughs> and so go to San Diego State or UCSD. Email me and I'll see if I can find a, a contact for you if you can't find it yourself. Um, my email address is obvious, rdines at ucsd.edu. It's just my name. And, and, and just find somebody that'll, that'll just introduce you to. I, I'm getting pulled off. I'm getting the hook in my neck here.
thank, thank you very much, Bob. It's, it's very uh, obviously a very uh, successful presentation uh, for everyone here. Uh, in terms of book, that we're, we offered you two books to take with you, by the way, on engineering. I suggest that would be a good place to start. And in terms of 14-year-old students uh, doing engineering, a lot of universities have summer programs for 14-year-old students. In fact, my granddaughter is 14 year old when she took her first engineering program at the University of Maryland. And, I, and I'm sure San Diego and, and the area has them. So go on the website and look for these uh, summer courses. And that's a good place to start. And that gives you your first connection to make the connections that uh, Professor Dines was talking about you to get for, for a subsequent follow-up uh, with companies in the area and other programs. So I very much encourage you to do it.